Welcome to the Security Weekly News wrap-up show for the week of 1 August uh, 2021. Black Hat, NSA, CISA, Autonomous Vehicles, Bazer, Evil Liver, I'll explain that, Lockbit, and all the show wrap-ups on this edition of the Security Weekly News. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. The complexity of cloud infrastructure means every organization's security challenges are unique. Whether your challenge is threat hunting, policy management, cloud workload protection, or all of the above, Uptix helps you quickly identify and eliminate observability gaps in your security programs. Uptix, analytics for the modern attack surface, observability for the modern defender. That's Uptix, U-P-T-Y-C-S. Check them out at securityweekly.com forward slash Uptix for a free trial. Cyber criminals are working overtime. They're leveraging activity around the COVID vaccine to disguise phishing attacks, hoping to steal money or personal information from your employees or customers. The Barracuda Email Threat Scanner is a free tool you can use right now to help protect your business and ultimately your reputation. The Barracuda Email Threat Scanner analyzes your Office 365 accounts and identifies malicious emails that slipped past your gateway and into inboxes. Find the cybersecurity threats hiding in your Office 365 email. Use the Barracuda Email Threat Scanner for free right now at securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. All right, I'm Doug White from Roger Williams University, and welcome to Security Weekly News Wrap-Up Show. Uh, this week on Application Security Weekly number 160, John and Mike had Maggie Yaragui, uh, an offensive security researcher at Intel, on the show to talk about firmware security, which was very interesting to me. Uh, the idea uh, is that firmware is a real challenge. I think we all know that. And industry and, and, you know, and trying to maintain it is a pretty complicated issue. Uh, they went on to discuss some of the best practices around this. And, I mean, updating a firmware on my new motherboard is scary enough. When you start messing with that low-tolerance valve system, well, you know, buckle up. Because, uh, yeah, that stuff's pretty scary. I mean, it, 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 like I say, even when you just do it at home on a simple, like a little old motherboard, it's like scary. And then you start thinking about, I could bring the whole factory to a bricked halt. Yeah. So an interesting, uh, an interesting segment. On Business Security Weekly number 226, Jason Adrian and Josh Marpet welcome Edward L Liebig. Uh, the CISO at Delvium LLC. Edward was on to talk about how critical infrastructure is under attack uh, and how both the IT and the OT environments are vulnerable. Uh, boy, boy, are they. Uh, they go on to talk about how everyone thinks this should be f fixed by now, but why it has not been fixed. And I mean, you know, literally, I mean, think about that. I mean, I get that all the time. Like, why is OT still a problem? I'm like, because it was always a problem. We just didn't know it yet. And, you know, fixing it's not just as simple as putting up a firewall. Uh, in the second segment, 10 security tools all remote employees should have. Uh, in one in four security teams report to the CIO, but would benefit from CISO leadership. P please don't let the, you know, who's watching the watchers? Really? You haven't reported the CIO, but they do. State of the cybersecurity survey results, destigmatizing reporting security vulnerabilities, and more. On Enterprise Security Weekly 237, Adrian, Paul, and April Wright brought on Matt Cawthorn, the VP of Cloud Security at ExtraHop. Matt was on to talk about exfiltrate, encrypt, exploit as a litany for ransomware. Um, yeah, and, but really how, how all that's becoming passe in favor of compromising dev servers to introduce exploits for large-scale attacks. Very interesting topic to me. I, I, I like that segment, and I, it's definitely check that one out. In the second segment, David Finger, uh, the VP of Product Marketing at Fortinet, joined in to talk about ransomware in terms of modern networks and how the battles, which are rarely won, are fought on the endpoints, even in vastly distributed networks, which, you know, I mean, I, that's the big compromise, right, is that when you people, uh, if the user clicks the link, it's over. Um, David goes on to talk about how security ops should be positioning themselves to deal with this going forward. So uh, a very relevant and timely discussion as ransomware is continues to be probably the top security threat 
out there, even though the real threat is, of course, the endpoint. And, uh, and, and again, if you look at what the top threats are, it's phishing, it's credential stuffing, and ransomware is the, is the result. In the third segment, they had the news. Uh, Security and Compliance Weekly was not on this week. So, um, yeah, I, I didn't have a report on them. I was looking at it. Now i got to wait on it to scroll on by because I didn't have anything on that. Um, yeah. On Security Weekly News number 139, Jason Wood talked about Raccoon Stealer and how it can propagate using Google SEO. Uh, this was commentary on how this product works and what all it steals. Uh, he was calling it, and I think a lot of people are calling it Trash Panda in terms of infamous memes about danger noodles and boople snoots and all that kind of stuff that, uh, that you see out there. Uh, on Paul's Security Weekly number 705, up first was Rick Farina and Rick Melendick, uh, both board members at RF Hacker Sanctuary, who were on to talk about, well... RF Hacker Sanctuary, which is a think tank slash expert group focusing on radio frequency uh, security, and of course, you know, hence the name. Uh, RF Hackers provide speakers, panels, and wireless capture the flag games. So, a very interesting site indeed. Uh, they both have other jobs too, but I'll give them the RF Hackers credit. Uh, in the second segment, Scott Shefferman, the principal strategist, and Yuri Bulligan the founder and CEO from Eclipsium joined in to talk about the discovery of BIOS disconnect uh, that they did and their talk and demo this week at DEF CON 29. Uh, so that started, uh, DEF CON 29 started today. If you're unfamiliar with BIOS Connect, uh, well, basically it's a UEFI uh, component uh, that was designed to allow you to update your firmware. You know, on the, I mean, first time I saw this, it was great. You know, I was like, wow, I can actually update the firmware on this motherboard from the BIOS instead of having to download something, put it on a floppy disk, and then actually install a floppy disk drive, and then uh, try to update the firmware and hope the floppy disk doesn't fail in the middle of it. But instead, uh, this uh, BIOS Connect in, ends up allowing all these UEFI attacks that you've seen reported on the news and on Paul Security Weekly over and over again. Um, and it, it can brick the machine or load it up with malware, all kinds of different stuff. Definitely uh, interesting to me. And in the third segment, the news. So my favorite thread of the week is going to be legacy thinking with non-legacy systems. Okay, well, also with legacy systems. But so all of this came out of this story about Pwned Piper, which was a big news story this week. And Pwned Piper, if you missed out, uh, was about pneumatic tubes in hospitals. Um, we saw a lot of it, but it, uh, basically the attack or the, the vulnerability is a collection of nine total vulnerabilities on a pneumatic tube system that was produced by TransLogic. Uh, I mean, basically pneumatic tubes immediately, you know, and I said this before on Tuesday, but I, I keep saying it. The minute I hear pneumatic tubes, I, I really uh, start thinking about a big, you know, Victorian steam whistle, brass, Lots of cogs and, and you know clockworks and all this kind of stuff, uh, but if you need to ship things around some physical location and you know they're well tube sized things, I mean it makes perfect sense, right? I mean it, it's one of those if it ain't broke don't fix it. I hate those kind of expressions, but that one actually applies. And I you know this is a very steampunk device that's been modernized and you know and brought into the modern age so that you can use it. Uh, there. And so when I was initially reading about this translogic system, I was thinking, you know, more Doctor Who kind of things with plungers and Daleks and all that kind of stuff. But it's really an actually modern system that is very well designed. And uh, anywhere you need to send physical things in the hospital, there you go. And hospitals use this for prescriptions. They use it for, well, I don't know what all they use it for, but they, they use it for all sorts of things. Uh, and I used to work in a bank, and banks often use pneumatic tube systems for sending uh, transactions and or currency. Um, you know, it was it was actually considered pretty secure in the building because, you know, instead of handing a an envelope full of banknotes to somebody that's going to run them over to the other building, you could just maybe, you know, stick them in this pneumatic tube, which goes through the wall. Uh, we used to use this for sending uh, nuclear materials as well. So they, uh, I worked for a nuclear facility, and they actually shipped uh, nuclear materials. This, But I brought this up as a threat because it seems like with these sorts of systems, there's this tendency to put this in a sort of old-school context because I think everybody kind of envisions things like that. Uh, you know, as being sort of old fashioned and legacy and so forth. And, you know, the minute you start thinking about this as part of an OT, 
So that OT network is private. It's inaccessible. The tubes run through the walls instead of, you know, being accessible by people, you know, in the building. It's not like a mail cart. It's like, you know, literally a tube that's running through concrete. Uh, and, and they start, everybody starts going down that, you know, OT can't be compromised because it's never accessible model, that Purdue model that's been around for a long, long time. And you know, I mean, I mean, and, and some of that was kind of true 20, 30, 40, 50 uh -oh, years ago about OT networks that they couldn't be accessed, but it's certainly not true today. And there's the problem. Uh, well, there's two problems about this it, it, when you have this kind of thinking. And I've seen this in hospitals. And that one is that hospitals tend to be a lot more concerned about their patients and their patients' well-being than they are about people coming in and abusing equipment. You know, I mean, it, it's kind of like, what and it was like doctors offices learned that people would steal things out of doctors offices but they used to think they wouldn't and you know and i mean that's kind of what hospitals are supposed to be doing right worrying that maybe you're in pain instead of worrying if somebody's hacking the system and that you know maybe they can't put enough security on the system because they need it in an emergency and they have to get to it quickly um you know and, and i think medical and hospital personnel don't really think about that i mean they they're not hackers they don't think like hackers they think about i'm going to save somebody and you know I mean, I don't know what happens there, but but anyway, in the reality in the modern age, we do see a combination of both remote attacks and physical attacks being conducted against anyone and everyone, especially when it comes to ransomware and targeting the most vulnerable components is where the ransomware people go. Um, it's definitely something that I think ransomware people think about and they think, I want to go after a legacy system and that it you know, and, and why not go after a hospital because they're going to be the most desperate to get this back running and therefore they're going to shut the thing down. So I think that TransLogic was kind of in that, you know, in that model and that basically in the modern world, somebody in the hospital may just jump on there and do something. 20, 30 years ago, they didn't have knowledge of these systems. It was just some mystery device that was sitting over in the corner of the hospital. But today, it's easy enough that somebody's carrying around on their person a laptop or a cell phone, and they can look up these things while they're sitting in a waiting room or, or wandering around the hospital because people wander around the hospital. And I, I used to have a job that involved me being in a hospital all the time. And, you know, people went wandering. Sometimes people would turn up in the morgue and you're like, hi, can I help you? And they're like, uh, I was looking for the snack bar. Like, this is not it. Um, but once that happens, you know, somebody says, well, here's this thing. Somebody looks up the make and model and they say, wow, look, if you just type this on the screen, this might happen. And so, you know. It was something, again, I think a lot of older people can't conceptualize that somebody would actually cause a hospital to have a problem. And breaking the hospital using these devices would be devastating. So guess what? Ransomware goes there. And from what I can ascertain, a lot of places would just shut down if they didn't have their pneumatic tube system. I mean, the hospital relies on this. And I'm sure they have backup plans. I did do some disaster recovery planning with hospitals a, a few years ago, and they often did have some backup plans. But a lot of times, sometimes the backup plans got, like, lost. Uh, we were talking about what if the x-ray machines didn't work and they, didn't, they no longer had the ability to use the old x-ray machine, which required you to develop a film, like a, like a photograph. So that leg legacy thinking that they had was was being applied to non-legacy systems. So if you have systems, I mean any systems, be sure you aren't using these kind of cop-outs to avoid having to come up with plans for this. You know, it's OT, it's OT, it's safe. You know, so it can be a real problem. And now the news. Uh, it was Black Hat this week, uh, so in DEF CON starting today, uh, there was a lot of talks. Uh, all that's, you know, you can look at the schedule and so forth. We did a lot of content about it, and some people from um, – uh, our group attended this in person, including some of our SC Media friends that I talked to on Wednesday and Thursday. So there's interviews with them if you want to hear what they had to say about it. They were actually there in person. So there was, I, I did ask some questions about what's it like being in, you know, it's like this is also the longest I haven't been in Las Vegas in a long time. So now I've, I, this is two years plus going on three years, I guess, really, because I haven't been there since DEF CON 27. So been a while. 
Um, but all that content's on our site if you're interested in hearing about the talks, uh, the interviews with people that did talks and gave talks. Um, I did really like a research piece on the creation of fake identities where researchers created 300 fake identities and then signed them up on 185 different legitimate websites just to see how quickly the PII would translate into them getting phone calls, emails, and so forth, texts from other sites. And they, they documented all that. And that session was called Use and Abuse of Personal Information. Very interesting one. I introduced uh, Charles uh, Givre about his Apache drill project and schemaless queries on Wednesday. So that's also on the site if you want to check it out. A lot of great content. And DEF CON 29, which I'm also missing, alas, starts today and runs through Sunday with virtual content as well. So I think you can still register for DEF CON uh, is going on if you want to catch some of the talks and so forth there. And I, they had a reduced price, I think, for that. Uh, so even if you couldn't or you wouldn't, you didn't want to travel uh, this year, you can still catch uh, DEF CON content, and I'm sure they'll be posting talks and so forth later. Uh, surely somebody will sponsor me to attend next year. I, I hope anyone, anybody out there, Bueller, Bueller. Uh, at, also at Black Hat this week, CISA director Jen Easterly announced that there would be a public-private partnership with a number of companies, including Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, uh, with a specific focus to fight cybercrime. Uh, Jen was confirmed to the CISA post uh, by the United States Senate in July, so fairly new to the job. Uh, but this will, she, she, uh, Jen is from the Army. Uh, but this is going to be called the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, uh, which is a mouthful, or the JCDC, which is a lot easier to say. The JCDC, but you can't pronounce it right. Just, just yeah, no, JCDC. Uh, but 20 other firms have already announced that they're uh, joining this, including AT&T, Palo Alto, CrowdStrike, FireEye, and, and others, uh, along with the ones I mentioned earlier. So a bunch of big players getting in this space. I presume, Jen, I presume my invitation's in the mail somewhere. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the I, I really like these kind of ventures. I, I think it's smart. Uh, they've worked in the past for other things, like after 9-11, they set up these things called fusion centers, and the fusion centers were designed to distribute information uh, and, and sort of collate and distribute information between federal, state, local law enforcement, and even private sector individuals. And that led to a lot of input, I think, that, that both sides needed. So it was really good because I got involved in that, and it was really interesting to me to talk to the people at the Fusion Center, and we could contribute information as well as receive information from them. And that information was then handed down to other agencies and other local law enforcement even were getting bulletins and updates. So I think this is probably the beginning of some good moves for CISA. Given that eight federal agencies failed an audit two years ago, and seven of them are still failing. So CISA, you know, Jen and CISA may well have their work cut out for them with this. Uh, the Departments of State, Housing and Urban Development, Transportation, Agriculture, Health and Human Services, Education and Social Security, all giant departments in the United States government, all got C's or D's in their latest audit. Wow. Uh, the DHS, which was flagged years, two years ago, uh, had made significant improvements and got their grade up to a B on this class. Uh, but one of the interesting tidbits that you, I, I don't think you'll find surprising, five of the agencies, and, and this, this did not shock me one bit, five of these agencies could not even produce a comprehensive asset inventory of their network. And I mean, given the number of times I was auditing something and somebody said, I'm not sure that we know it's there since we but we know it's there but we can talk to it but we don't know where it is physically or what it is i mean i've heard people say stuff like that one time i was doing an audit and a server that was detected in the network by our scanning uh turned out to be in the home of a, a literally their home of a dismissed employee someone who'd been fired but was still maintaining it for some bizarre love relationship with an AS400. I, I mean, the, I mean, I went and met with the person and they were just like, I just love AS400 and I didn't want to give up my management of it. So I brought it home with me when I left. And I was like, what? 
and it had like hundreds of thousands of customer records. It was crazy. I mean, but anyway, the report went on to say that Einstein, the Einstein program, which is a national cybersecurity protection system for these agencies, was not as effective as it needs to be to detect and prevent attacks. The last part of this is that they then called on Congress to update the Federal Information Monitoring Act of 2014 and to formalize CISA's role as lead agency for cybersecurity. So that would be pretty good. Considering that the government actually has people that believe the earth is flat working there and that no one can agree on whether it's day or night currently without a big, huge argument, and even then they refuse to believe it. Uh, well, this may be a big charge, so call me, CISA. I'm, I'm, we're here. Um, since we're bashing the government anyway, the NSA released a set of tips. I'm not going to bash the NSA, though. I, they released a set of tips on an information sheet this week that provided guidance directed at end users regarding the use of radio frequency enabled devices, so cell phones and so forth. Uh, I mean, it's the, the document is a lot of basic hygiene stuff, but I, you know, as we all know, not everybody washes their hands. I mean, I honestly didn't really know this until the pandemic. I mean, who doesn't wash their hands? But people don't. You know, I mean, one time I was at an airport, and this person I used to know walked out of the restroom and had this other person with them, and they did a you know the good old American you know stick out your hand thing, and I, which I don't like. I didn't even like this before the pandemic, uh, but I and I noticed when I, I I was forced to shake. You know, you you can't not shake people's hands, right? They, they come up and stick their hand in your face, and you kind of have to shake it. And their hand was really dry, and I was like. I bet this person didn't wash their hand when they went to the restroom. I mean, they did not wash his hand, and then he shoves it in my face, and I have to grab onto it and fondle your filth-ridden paw? Really? Let's not bring back handshakes, okay? I mean, I'm, I'm advocating for some kind of, like, eye blink thing or something that you do when you meet people, like, you know, just like you blink your eyes four times rapidly or something. I think that would be so much better. Anyway, I digress. The NSA put this out. It does have in my opinion, sound basic hygiene advice about Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and near field. And honestly, I mean, it's a good basic document that's free for you to use. So send it to your users. They probably don't have a clue about this stuff. They probably don't even know what near field is, and then yet they may be using it. Cisco patched their small business VPN routers uh, this week and to remove a 9.8 CVE that allowed for unvalidated HTTP requests, which would allow denial of service or, or even run arbitrary code. I mean, it's not entirely Cisco's fault that this thing existed. I mean, why, they, why do you think they put a separate port on the device for management? I mean, there's actually a port labeled management on the device. And they, the reason they thought was that you would protect that HTTP web interface. I mean, it, I grant you, it was a damn naive assumption on their part. But, geez, use a private VLAN for this stuff or something. But a lot of people like to allow, you know, work for home, hate the idea of setting up a VPN to a private management network. So they just say, hey, HTTP, open it to the world. What harm could it cause? I mean, you know, it's a router, a firewall. I mean, you know, okay. I mean, it just bothers me more than you not washing your hands, really. Uh, it really does. It's a lot grosser, really. Don't, don't do this. I mean, I can always wash my hands again, but you can't unhack your, your, uh, your router. And, and even though it's patched, but patch it anyway, you know, you, you still should not be doing this. I, I, I wish I could read this in Sam Kennison's voice, but I can't, so I'm not going to. So if you're a criminal or you're just, or just your friendly neighborhood hacker or Spider-Man, you may not reveal your true nature. And if you don't like your identity, well, you can just change it, right? I mean, Peter Parker could have just got a new suit and changed his name to Arachno Boy or something and, and, you know, and then had Spider-Man sue Arachno Boy. So you know, they go to court, misuse the trademark. It makes it look like Arachno Boy is not really Peter Parker. I mean, that would have made it all come together. So, of course, ransomware gangs change their name to avoid prosecution. I mean, have you ever watched a crime show? You know, I mean, it's like, what's the guy's M.O., Barry? Well, after he dismembers them, he makes a perfect Denver omelet and leaves half in each severed hand. Every time, always the same, always. Cheddar cheese, always the same eggs, everything's always perfect. Man, those are good omelets. Wait, are, are you saying you ate one of the omelets, killer's omelets? Uh, okay, okay, wait, that's a little, I got a loft there, but I, I, I get distracted with the omelet killer idea. Netflix, call me. It's, it's a, a series. 
Anyway, Dark Side, which is the crew who hit Colonial Pipeline and then got hit back by the DOJ, made a big deal about they're giving up their evil empire, turning to the good side of the force, embracing Yodaism, yada, 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 go forth and sin no more. But of course, almost immediately, another group that pretty much does the same thing, uses the same techniques and the same encryption, etc., emerged called Black Matter. And they started operating again. Now, some people think this is Revil. Some people think it's Dark Side. I, I mean, you know, Revil had already done this whole song and dance as well after the Kaseya attack and, you know, and said, we're out. We're not doing this anymore. We've seen the errors of our ways. But, you know, Revil may show back up as liver. That's Revil backwards. I, I mean, you know, I mean, if you didn't notice that. And, and I was also thinking, I immediately was, was thinking, well, like, live liver, because that would be like evil Revil backwards live liver band name called it anyway black matter is is maybe e revil it might be dark side maybe revil and dark side emer have merged together or maybe they were the same thing all along i mean nobody knows they're all anonymous and it's all the rage to announce you're giving up a life of crime and turning to good i mean why not can you can you say kohlbergian pre-conventionalism i can anyway since we're on this and and by we i mean me uh, Baser is a vishing group that's been around for a while. Uh, but vishing is where they try to voicemail you and, and get you to call them. So you sort of fish yourself, right? It's like teach a man to, what is it? Teach, teach it, give a man a fish and he, he swindles you for one day, teach a man to fish and he's rich for life. I, I have something like that. Uh, anyway, I get these things all the time. Basically it, it's, you know, it's a fishing story about your account is about to be charged or has been charged a whole lot of money. And you need to renew your subscription to Zavaria Nakin monthly magazine, which means, um, I'm not going to tell you what that means. <laughs> Actually it means, it means Sweden naked. Uh, in Swedish, uh, and I probably mispronounced it, sorry. Uh, but, uh, you know, and then they get you to call back. So they also do this with a lot of local numbers. I had one yesterday from a local number with a local name on it, uh, and I, I listened to the message just because I'm always curious about these things. I even called it back because I thought, I'm going to see what, I, you know, I grabbed my burner phone, I called it back, and, you know, and the outcome is exactly what you would expect. They're trying to get you to download and run something like log me in, they used to do all the time, and or have you, you know, better yet, now they get you to download something very, very subtle, and which might install a DLL or PowerShell or some other kind of script. But uh, the group is called Bazer, and it's using Bazer Caller, which has been around a while, and Bazer Loader, which have also been around a while, to get you to infect yourself. Basically, this new one, they send a protected Excel file that will assist you uh, to enable editing, which then, uh, and they have a person on the line that's going to talk you through that. That lets Bazer Loader run, and then the latest round has an auto bill. It, they've got different ones. There's one about an auto bill premium paid package, a call you have to call to cancel, a fitness program membership that's about to charge you, and or an auto renewal for a whole bunch of different things. I keep getting one for McAfee. It says that my McAfee account's about to be renewed to like a premium package, and it's going to be a bunch of money. If I don't want it, I don't want it. I better call right away. Uh, but anyway, they pretend to download the whole thing. Uh, I actually called in, uh, and then, you know, after I let, let them talk to me for a while and act like really, really, really stupid, and then, you know, you can pretend to have a stroke on the phone or something. I, I, the guy was helping me from my town did not call 911 when I pretended to have a stroke, but he did say his name was Rob. And I had one yesterday from somebody named Cindy that was supposedly in my town. So you, you might want to do a note for your users on this one. I know we've all heard these things, but they haven't, and it is clever. A new version of LockBit 2.0 ransomware can apparently use Active Directory group policies to encrypt the domain. LockBit's from 2019, and there's various versions of it released over the years, but this latest one has a back-end ad site which talks about selling the malware, how you can make millions of dollars ransomwareing people. Uh, malware Hunter team found the site. Bleeping Computer had a report on it as well as some other people. Um, the ad contains a list of features that you will get along with a set of Gensu knives if you, if you order now. Uh, it claims it can use group policy to encrypt a domain. And I was like, well, at first I was like, well, really? But basically what it does is if somebody runs it with enough privilege, it creates a new group policy object on the domain controller and then pushes that out to everyone, everything in the domain, which makes sense. I mean, it's a handy feature to have. And, you know, if you're trying to sell ransomware tools, you, you know, you might as well add features to it. But the policy disables Defender, Alerts. It's actually customizable. Uh, it, it, it disables notifications to Microsoft. 
and it creates a scheduled task on the system to do whatever it is you want it to do. Um, all you've got to be able to do is get it on the domain controller with enough privilege to run it. One of the interesting features I saw was it has a print bombing mechanism that will will send ransom notes to all the printers in the organization. It even has its own administrative panel that you can get. Uh, it can remove shadow copies and so forth. Now, how much would you pay? Order today and receive this copy of William Shatner singing his favorite show tunes. Um, Finally, autonomous car. I know, finally, well, autonomous cars. Uh, I love the idea. Sit back, have a drink, read a book, take me to West 110th Street Jeeves and stop by the cigar shop on the way. Uh, but this article was talking about machine learning and autonomy in vehicles and safety, so it was pretty interesting to me. Uh, and, and they were really talking about trolley problems. You know, do, do you run over the three people on the left or the right? And how do you decide? And, you know, humans do a terrible job of driving anyway, in my opinion. Just look at the people on the roads when I came over here today. They have drinks. Uh, they try to give themselves tattoos in the car. They get in fist fights with each other. Uh, they shoot at each other and so forth, all while traveling at high speeds and vehicles on crowded roads. So how could ML do any worse than this? I mean, the article basically says that if we quit basing cars on AI, you know, so we quit trying to base them on human behavior and, and, and don't emulate human decision making. But instead, we just instill the idea of safety in the ML guidance while autonomous vehicles would do a much better job. And I completely agree. I mean, there's a slim chance that you might get Daleks or Skynet, but it's just a slim chance. I, I mean, I, I figured it was like one in a hundred thousand chance you get Daleks, maybe, you know, one in 50,000 you get Skynet. But I mean, you know, um, uh, any, a million people die every year in traffic accidents. I, I watched a lady get uh, coached through the eye test at the DMV once, and I don't think she could actually even see the testing machine. So she was just cold reading the clerk. And she would, they would say, what do you see, ma'am? And she would go, A-I-G. And the clerk would go, do you mean an H? And she'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, an H. And, I mean, I once saw this old, this 1978 Oldsmobile lead sled station wagon the size of a small naval vessel run a light. And there was a police officer sitting right beside me. And, and I rolled my window down. I said, did you see that? And he goes, oh, yeah, it's Mrs. Harrigan. She didn't stop for any light that was put up after her husband died. So I'm not mad and whether she's scary so you know but a car that has lidar sonar radar a dozen sen sensors in 360 directions that i don't even have it can't text it can't drink and drive etc shouldn't be held to a higher standard than mrs harrigan i mean i really think the ml would do a better job anyway that's a news wrap up for the first week of august uh, in the declining time of play we have tons of content from black hat so check all that out and i'll see you next time on the security weekly news